y'all doing today? It's your boy Jermaine from Shovel Nose Hogs back with another video. And I have a special guest with me, uh, Jeff Gelwood from JMG Reptile. And uh, a couple weeks ago, we did uh, a pretty long interview, three hours with Joe from Hogging Out. So if you haven't seen that video, I'll leave a card at the top. Um, but for this video, I want to get into a more specific topic, which is line breeding. So I'm going to start it off uh, asking Jeff, uh, what is your definition of line breeding? Uh, my definition of line breeding would be uh, a select, like selectively breeding a particular like quality or characteristic, um, such as like say if you find a hog nose that has a little more yellow to it, and that's like a natural uh, occurring color that can you know pop up, and you start selectively line breeding uh, that particular characteristic until you get it more exaggerated. So there are qualities that can be found naturally, and you're just selectively line breeding um, those qualities. And trying to improve on them and those are those are called polygenetic traits okay and so from your experience what is the correct way to line breed to for the most part minimize genetic defects uh, starting with like a larger gene pool um kind of like say if you have like you could start with just like say two hog nose like um 11 ghost kind of started with that uh, well basically with well, this is actually a probably pretty good example um, just how I came about my lemon ghost. I got my original founding male that kind of had some like yellow greenish coloration, uh, yellow greenish coloration, um, higher yellow belly. And I ended up breeding him to just kind of like a normal looking wild type female. And I got some babies right away that were actually pretty bright yellow. And I thought that was, you know, of course I was like, wow, that's really cool that this showed up so quick. Um, some of these characteristics from the father. And the mom kind of looked more like somewhat normal, but all the babies had a degree of yellow, some more than others. And so I kept those back and I started uh, line breeding those. But through that process, I actually incorporated yellows um, and snakes that looked like that they would um, complement that the kind of le whole lemon ghost uh, project. So I remember I picked up this really cool yellow phase male from in Daytona when I was like 15 and... Um, this guy, I remember he had a big clutch of hog, uh, you know, big clutch from a hog nose. And a lot of the babies had some yellowish. And he had a couple that were way more yellow than the others. So I purchased one of those. Um, I remember I purchased some really nice uh, yellowish hog nose from Richard Evans that came from his jungle project. I purchased those. Um, and I definitely got some blonde phase and a couple others. And uh, so then I had pretty good diversity as I was line breeding. And I got some, like, you know, different ranges, but as, um, I kept line breeding, you know, you started getting some pretty good, uh, consistency. <laughs> so, and then that's at that point, I started kind of coining the name of the project, like lemon Ghost. Um, and once you have like a pretty good, like, uh, gene pool, like of like various hoggles like that, you can actually cross them back and forth quite a few times. And so, you know, I've been working with like selectively line breeding lemon Ghost for about like 20 years. And I uh, haven't really had any issues. I did uh, a couple of times experiment and go to like like F2 and F3. And I started noticing like, you know, when you went up to F3, you might start getting like slightly like shorter faces or, um, you know, a couple of minor defects. So then I don't really, I don't do that anymore. So I have quite a few um, uh, lemon ghosts, actually. They're kind of like almost like three or four separate lines and some are outcrossed. And I have some that are outcrossed in extreme purple red. And then I end up breeding them back into like lemon ghosts, you know, or animals from the lemon ghost project that have high percentages of that original line bred gene. Okay. And so for those who are new to reptiles and breeding, what, what is F1 and F2? What, what do you mean when you say that? Uh, those are the first generations of breeding a uh, brother and sister together. So um, that's like considered more like inbreeding. There is some inbreeding that occurs in the wild with like locale populations. So it's really not bad to do. You just don't want to do it too much. Like there's certain species where I've seen it with people with leopard geckos go up to like F12 with um, no issues. And I've seen it with corn snakes, people going up like F7, F8, F9. Um, hog nose, I don't think they do deal quite as well with uh, like longer term inbreeding. So I don't really ever go, I would never really go too much past like F2. I think F2 is kind of like good and then you want to do some outcrossing. And some of those issues too I've seen with F3 because I didn't really do uh, probably a large enough sample size with that um, test, you know, breeding and everything where you can actually determine, say, that was the actual cause. It may have been something else, um, but, you know, I didn't try to find out if that was the issue. 
I would assume that they can go further than that because if you look where hognose are in the wild, there are isolated populations and there's almost little pockets of them on these uh, prairie habitats. So there's probably a good deal of, um, you know, some inbreeding going on in the wild for sure. Okay. And so with your, your lemming ghost line, uh, at what point did you start noticing the Woma pattern and where do you think that came from? Um, well, you know what? It's funny. I've actually seen some Woma like hognose, um, in like, uh, from pictures of wild hognose people have found before they're, they're uncommon, but I've seen a couple where it's like, Oh wow, that's got that kind of Woma ringed uh, pattern. And, it, and it's not ringed like a tiger. It's ringed like, like a Woma. But it popped up the first ones when I was like around like 18 or 19. And it's probably a combination of just line breeding a bunch of various looking high yellow hognose into my base project. And there was basically probably an existing um, pattern anomaly that can be expressed from wild types, such as like I just mentioned, like, you know, I've seen one, I've seen a couple from the wild people found that look like Womas. So that means that's a, you know, an expression that could be found even in wild populations. And in the late nineties, early two thousands, almost all these hognose were not many generations from wild populations. And so, and I know my lemon ghost wasn't my, actually my first two pair of hognose I ever bred. I know they were both wild caught and you know, the hobby's come a long way now. Now you have pretty much like no wild caught and there's not really any necessary or need for them. And there's a lot of, you know, everything obviously is mostly, captive born it's very actually it's hard to find anything that's wild caught or even first generation from wild caught but it started popping up around like 18 or 19 and start with just kind of like triangular kind of like a uh, shaped like diamond pattern up around the side of the neck mostly um some had a little wider blotching and I, those are cool so i'm gonna breed those and it wasn't really until i was probably about 23 so about like you know like 10 11 years ago where i started getting some that had really nice thick banding um maybe a couple maybe a year or two before then and uh yeah i think it was more around when i was like 2021 20, where i started seeing some pretty decent ones but by the time i was 23 24 i was producing full ringed womas but i was already calling them womas before that okay and so where did you get the name woma from is because it kind of looked like a woma python is that is that yeah. where you got it from yeah and also because like <laughs> the ball python i always i was always a fan of watching the ball python hobby and all the genes popping up and there was a woma ball python and uh i think it's kevin mccurley came up with the that term for that uh gene and i thought that was a pretty cool name and i thought it applied and uh i probably should have taken a name <laughs> so you know elsewhere but i mean actually you don't really see the woma gene being talked about too much in the ball python hobby anymore it's not utilized as you know that frequently anymore that was uh more of a somewhat subtle gene although there's a hidden gene woma that one's uh, a lot more uh, abundant and commonly used, but the original um, Woma, you don't really see or too, hear too much about that gene anymore. All right. And so in terms of your lemon ghost, since you've been line breeding them for 20 years, do you think you've maxed out the yellow color saturation or like where, where do you see that project going maybe in the next three to five years? Um, actually, I think a lot of these line bred traits, the cool thing is, I mean, you could look at like koi carp, um you know, like japanese koi carp those originated you know from just selectively line breeding just more brightly colored carp and then over a period of a few hundred years they've come so far as to produce all these polygenetic you know really you know impressive diversities of like you know um colors and everything that uh, you know they line bred to be a particular way whether it be like jet black ones or white ones that have the orange and black blotches on them and even ones that are kind of like striped and so i think it's still in its infancy um i think the hog nose market is actually still early uh believe it or not it's come so far in the last 20 years it's completely evolved it's evolved from you know just albinos pastel pinks and hypos that were just recently discovered back 20 years ago and there was locales and there was the beginning of lion breeding and so i think that's actually still in its infancy i think lemon ghost there can be a lot done with them and that's the cool thing about lion bread traits uh i think they're strongly underutilized and you can actually uh, you can actually you could always improve on them now there is some things you got to watch out for i've actually watched people over lion breed and they get away from uh kind of uh 
the probably the original main goal of the project and it starts working against them. And I've seen that happen with a number of projects and leopard geckos and a couple of times with corn snakes, um, in my opinion. Okay. And so what kind of drew you to that yellow color? Because there's, you could have chose greens, um, reds, um, maybe even like brown. What, what drew you to that yellow to start line breeding that color? Well, there was really no yellow hog nose at the time. The closest thing were blondes, and the blondes were not really so much yellow. They were more of like a really nice light phase with like kind of like a faded hypo-ish kind of like um, oval pattern. They kind of almost looked like more like, I bet they originated from the new, like New Mexico locality hog nose. And some of them kind of had like, you know, kind of like a real pale kind of golden yellowish coloration. So they definitely complement, you know, breeding real high concentrated like yellow uh, hog nose to them. But there wasn't any really, there wasn't yellows, there was reds. And so that was the big draw. But the, the other big draw was I had the particular animal. That's one thing with line breeding. Um, some people will start trying to line breed from, say, an animal that has some qualities that they might want to try to tweak. Um, and so they'll try, try to line breed, it, line breed it, but it might work against them because it might um, just be a, a trait that really isn't um, trying to think of the word. It's not very consistent and it's not really that controllable. Um, basically like trying to, hmm, there, there's some probably decent examples. Some are tougher, like green hypo. That's a tougher one. Um, you know, you have reds, extreme reds. Uh, red is a pigment that is more commonly produced like naturally. So that's a much easier uh, color to line breed bright yellows aren't quite as common, so it's a little more difficult. Then you, when you get the greens, you can actually go in the wild and sometimes see, you know, hog nose that almost kind of look like green hypos. And it's like, okay, they originated from something like that. That's like a wild variation almost that's been line bred and perfected more. And, but that one's a little harder one to control because it usually involves like a lighter base color, like grayish or whitish. And when you outcross it, that can be easily washed away because those are light tones. And if you line breed into something that has more dominant, darker tones, that's immediately going to kind of contradict it a little bit. And so, and then the green too is a bit more subtle because like, you know, hog nose, they do produce some green pigments, but they don't produce like much saturated green pigments. The most saturated green pigments you're going to find are going to be something like, well, sable increases that, but that's a recessive gene. So by putting something really green or something that's already producing green into sable, you might be able to get disabled to bring that out a little more and then you have things like lemon ghost because you know there's obviously some green pigment to create yellow and you do see some greenish in them so actually i think lemon ghosts are among some of the greenest hog nose but it's kind of um not as apparent because you have that just bold bright yellow coming through but there needs to be green pigment in there too i mean you don't really ever see lemon ghosts without you know some green i mean you get some there kind of just like more like you know a real light kind of you know subtle yellow okay and so are there any other lines that you have uh developed or are currently working with uh just like really lemon ghost woma um i kind of have my own line of red phase I, actually i got these um reds in daytona back like 20 years ago that were nebraska locality and cause i kept trying to buy reds from richard evans and, I, and this one other guy they'd only bring like a couple to daytona and every time i got there they were always sold out of them so uh i just found these ones um and it's from my craig trumbrower and i bought them and started line breeding those and then later on i bought extreme red albinos some purple line stuff um and i was always getting red face from other people and then incorporating them into my uh just red projects and so i kind of have uh, a lot of my like extreme red albinos and purple extreme red albinos i have now are the culmination of like uh, quite a few red face lineages in there. So, but okay. that's about it. All right. So what is your goal with your red face? Is Are you trying to make it look a little different from the other ones? Yeah. Um, the one thing I do is when I line breed, I don't try to really actually change anything until I see something that I think can be changed. So with some of my really nice purple extreme red albinos, you get some of these ones that have like a lot of lavender and bluish between their scales and some have like more whiter background, but then there's also some red in the background. 
So then I keep those back and breed them and see how that carries over. And if it carries over pretty well, or if it's really inconsistent and it's like something that's like pretty difficult, because I see some traits out there where, you know, they've existed for 10 or 12 years and it's kind of hard to get, um, you know, a defined characteristic out of them where you can like, without a doubt say, yeah, that's from that lineage. Um, and though that's just kind of like an example of a line bread trait that's not that line breedable. Um, it might be over a long term, but it's going to be more subtle. So sometimes when I see stuff, if I start trying to line breed it and it's not giving me results after a few generations, that means I'm kind of fighting against the, you know, against the current and I'll usually abandon that project and just outcross it. Okay. So about how many generations does that take to where you say, okay, this is not working out. I'm going to abandon it. Um, with leopard geckos, I've gone as long as four or five. Sometimes the abandoned stuff can actually help you out too, because a lot of times it's not like a complete waste of time. Usually it does look pretty cool and you can cross it into something and you might get some nice results. Um, but then it just kind of ends up getting diluted and, um, you know, kind of goes away. But after like two or three generations, if I'm not seeing really strong definitive characteristics, I might question it. And by the fourth generation of the project, if it's still not really looking that consistent and it's something that's more subtle and I'm getting a varying degree of results and there might be only a couple good ones, you know, that resemble the characteristics of which in the direction of which I'm trying to go, I'll keep those back and then like, you know, put them in other stuff. But at that point, that's when I'd probably start dissolving the project. Okay. And so a couple of weeks ago, you did a podcast uh, on the Palmetto State Geckos channel. And I remember uh, when I watched it, you mentioned that the leopard geckos are the king of line breeding. And since you do breed leopard geckos, what are some of the things you learned from breeding that uh, particular species of reptile that you kind of incorporated with the hog and the snakes? Well, with leopard geckos, you can get really quick results compared to other species because leopard geckos, you're getting a turnaround in about like 12, 14 months. So within 10 years of line breeding, you can, and say you have a couple projects you started and 10 years down the road, you basically have 10 generations nearly, um, if not 10 generations of experience with seeing results of um, selectively line breeding projects. And so that's kind of actually a lot of these um, examples I've given were kind of uh, taken from leopard geckos to agree. I mean, it's stuff I've learned simultaneously while line breeding hognos and leopard geckos because I've been line breeding hognos about as long as I've been line breeding leopard geckos. Leopard geckos, though, it's obviously just been way more generations just because of their ability to reproduce pretty quickly. I mean, sometimes I'm breeding males at eight, nine months old. My females are, you know, 10 to 14 months old, depending. If they take 15 or 16 months. I wait that long. Um, but... With leopard geckos, that the, yeah, there's very few actually straight hereditary traits. Most of the variations and all these cool colors you see are all done through lion breeding. And lion breeding is extremely celebrated in the leopard gecko community because actually the traits that hold their value the most and you can do the most with all end up being lion bred. And if you look at all the recessive traits and you know, incomplete dominant traits, they really wouldn't be nowhere near as exciting or cool if there wasn't all this, you know, line bred uh, and poly, you know, these polygenetic traits that you could also incorporate and work on. And then everybody can have their own lines. Uh, they can work on their own projects. Sometimes that can be a little bit of a dispute though, because sometimes some people will kind of like, um, you know, uh, jump the gun on saying, Hey, this is a new line, but there are a lot of lines um, within the leopard geckos. Um, and you, when you see how cool and the strong diversity of uh, patterns and colors and different projects you have with leopard geckos, it's like this could actually, that kind of um, breeding can be taken and applied to a lot of other species. Hognos are definitely one. Um, I'm not saying everybody should just start line breeding the, the heck out of them. And, you know, but if you see something that's a little different and it runs pretty true and it looks different and has different characteristics from like other existing stuff, and even if it has characteristics that look similar, you can start line breeding it and see if that like, you know, develops into something really cool. So it's kind of like red phase. I mean, there's different lines of red phase. I mean, you have like, you know, like the raging reds and stuff, um, you know, just cause there's other reds out there. That doesn't mean if you find like a red 
somewhere that has like an undisclosed lineage and it doesn't really look like any other lines of reds or it's even you can confirm it's not from other lines of reds that's okay to lion breed because actually i have a kind of another line of red um that i've been working on and it kind of popped up from these nice head albinos eyes breeding and that project started about 15 years ago and i kind of just call them red stripes but they end up kind of looking like the painted red stripe um or painted purple line stuff and they look different and some of them are kind of looking like almost like phoenix reds okay all right, so now let's kind of transition into uh, outcrossing. And so I have a pretty good question. Um, so I'm not sure if you're familiar with like Super Dwarf and Dwarf Retics, um, but yeah. Jared from Reach Out Reptiles, he's like a specialist in that. And uh, watching one of his videos, he said that in order to the kind of predict the size of like a Super Dwarf Retic, um, you have to base it off the size of the mother instead of the father. Um, have you noticed that when outcrossing that one particular gender tends to throw like a lime bread trait more than the other? I haven't noticed that, but I have noticed with certain um, projects, the males might look better than the females. Um, my dad lime bred uh, his uh, salmon snow coral ghost corn snake project. And from what I remember, his males always looked way better than his females generally. So his best examples were. Uh, males and uh, I think with hog nose that can sometimes be like that way with the lemon ghost I've noticed uh, early on my uh, lemon ghost males generally always look better and had brighter tails brighter bodies now it doesn't really matter as much I get like some of my best ones in my collection are actually females so I, it's kind of changed but I haven't noticed any difference in inheritance from say using um you know, a particular male or a particular female, them passing on like those polygenetic qualities better. And, uh, you know, it's, I haven't noticed anything like that. Okay. And, um, I do have a quick question that's kind of a little off topic, but in terms of, um, selectively breeding, like incomplete dominant more. So like, for example, some super arctics can have more melanin than others, especially around their head and the rest of their body. Um, even the ones that are like when you incorporate anaconda, some of them are pinkish. Have you ever tried selectively breeding for increasing the pink um, in the background or the melanin in the super arctic? Yeah, um, I think the you know red pigmentation, like the earth refores, you might be able to lion breed a bit more like i've tried to put you know my purple and extreme red lineages into them and uh it seems to have a little bit of an effect and i think it's a project that's going to take a lot more time um and it definitely can work it's funny because actually i'll go back to like my dad breeding salmon snow and coral ghost corn snakes there was actually other snow corn snakes that actually um produced a lot of pink and he had bought them and it would not run true at all it was pretty much just like they were like a weird anomaly variation and when he bred them there'd be like zero results and he bought these ones from this one project and it started running true and he started line breeding that and essentially what that trait is doing is exanthics cutting off pretty much most of the red and yellow pigmentation but it's not cutting off all the upper dermal expressions of these red pigments and so through selectively breeding he selectively line bred these red uh, pigments that are able to show through. So now you're developing an animal that produces an array of these pigments that, that um, the exantic trait isn't able to block as much. So you get this overall kind of pink snake. And, um, you know, so I think if you look at things from like that kind of perspective, um, you know, you'll understand like sometimes you have these incomplete dominant traits and you can line breed, um, you know, different colors and everything uh, that might be able to interfere. But I think sometimes you just can't. I think super arctic's a tough one to interfere with the melanin unless you have another, you know, actual hereditary trait that makes it produce melanin, such as like, you know, sable or Swiss chocolate would be the goal then if I wanted more mel melanin in my uh, super arctic's. But they're going to look different. Um, it's not going to look like, you know, a high black super arctic. Um, you know, that, that's very different looking. So you'll see, I know which ones you're talking about. They have a lot of black pigmentation. They look really dirty. They look really cool. 
And I know people that have kept those back. And actually, I told them back in the day because they asked my opinion. I was like, I don't think it's going to run true because you see such strong variations in super arctics of that trait. And it expresses differently. Like you'll get the ones with like super translucent scales and ones that have a lot of purplish um, trans- translucent scales, especially along the, the throat and along the side of the body. And uh, the people that I know that have kept those and line bred them, they haven't really had too much varying results. I have noticed I produced more of those crazy looking high black ones from some of my um, coral projects, super arctic coral projects. So those genes might actually interfere a little bit and cause them to spin off a little bit in a direction. But yeah, I think it's kind of tough sometimes to incorporate line bread traits that um, will change certain um, hereditary traits. Like with albino, it's easy to bring in more yellow or reds because albino is just removing melanin. So that's not interfering with it. With super arctic, it kind of obliterates background pigment. It's only allowing certain uh, tones of red or certain like uh, degrees of red pigments to be shown through. So it technically probably could be line bred, but it might just be more difficult. Some of these traits, I think they're fairly absolute, kind of like a leucistic. If you get leucistic with paradox and you try line breeding it, it's most likely not going to work. Okay. And so um, kind of going back to outcrossing, I want to talk about marketing like a particular line because like with your lemon ghosts, um, I've seen snakes that are marketed as lemon ghosts, but they don't really have that degree of yellow saturation as like yours. So in terms of outcrossing, um, when do you consider a snake lemon ghost? Like, is it, does it have to be 50% lemon ghost, 75%? What is your definition? Um, you all well, should definitely be at least 50%. And that's the one issue is um, polygenetic and line breeding uh, is not really, I don't think, um, largely understood in the hog nose hobby. So you have all kinds of people that get lemon ghosts, lemon ghosts, like outcrosses for me. Um, like I don't sell many pure lemon ghosts. So there's very, very, there's actually basically hardly any pure lemon ghost, um, in existence, even in my own collection, even my own collection, I don't really have many peers. Um, and the ones I do have that I consider pure, most of them are just like very high percentage pure because they kind of are outcrossed, but they're outcrossed into stuff that was outcrossed years ago with other yellows within the, within the project. Um, so they're like at least like 90 some percent, but you definitely want um, them to be at least 50%, um, them having like strong qualities, um, you know, cause when I breed like my lemon ghost together, you should see all of your babies yielding lemon ghost qualities that are very distinct. So that's like, uh, it's, it's kind of hard because like there's so many ones out there that I've seen and they're like, Hey, this is 11 ghosts. And I'm like, ah, it looks like it's about, I don't know, but it looks like it's in the 25% to 30 some percent who even knows. I don't think a lot of these people really keep track because I've never even seen anybody really list percentages. Um, a lot of people just think 11 ghosts is 11 ghosts. Then there's a lot of people that were saying for a while that, Hey, it's a dominant trait. And it doesn't really need to be line bred, which is untrue. Um, I developed the whole thing through selectively line breeding. And actually, over the course of years, I've actually kind of changed it. Originally, it was supposed to be a project that I was line breeding to have no black on the bellies. And then I noticed the ones with higher black on the bellies have more pigment saturation, which makes sense. So the ones with more pigment saturation, you end up getting brighter yellow. So now I'll, almost all my lemon ghosts have black bellies. I do get some every now and then though. Like I have a Woma lemon ghost male right now that his belly is like about 95, 98% yellow. Okay. That's pretty interesting. So would it be more appropriate to, um, to have them listed as maybe like a lemon ghost outcross or lemon ghost lineage? Yeah. Lemon ghost lineage. Uh, you know, the, the one thing that's a bit tough is cause you're going to have different, you know, qualities and stuff. So it'd probably be good to show examples of your better ones and then kind of like start paying attention to the percentages and just, uh, you know, the genetic history of your projects. Because if you don't really have any genetic history on it and it's like, a, say, like an outcross and you're bringing it to other stuff, you know, a 25% lemon ghost outcross is much different than a 75% lemon ghost outcross. And the funny thing is, sometimes these 25 and 50 percenters can look almost as good as 75 percenters. 
And so to a lot of people, they'll be like, well, what's the difference? The 75 percenter, even though it might not look much better um, and say this particular um, scenario or example, the 75 percenter is going to run more true when bread and everything. Because actually my one friend, he picked up a 25 percent lemon ghost. Uh, years ago, I sold a guy a uh, 50% lemon ghost that was actually very nice, and he outcrossed it to a green female. And it laid a lot of eggs, and out of about 18 babies, for some reason, because you get these variations. And so sometimes you'll get really good qualities from even low percentages. And they can run true, and they're definitely good for outcrossing and breeding back. So this would have been a really good one to breed back to pure lemon ghost because it's expressed so well. And it was a 25 percenter, and it was like neon yellow. It actually rivaled probably some of my 100 percenters. But when he went to breed it, the results weren't very good. Because, you know, once you're breeding a 25 percenter, even though it looks like a 100 percenter or close to it in some uh, case, in some of these 100 percenters cases, he is getting 12.5 percent lemon ghost outcrosses, and none of them even really looked good. And when he bred it back, he got actually varying results. He actually was never even able to even close to replicate the male's qualities. Um, but it was kind of like an anomaly show, uh, basically the highest expression, low percentage lemon ghost I'd ever seen. And I'll even see it with 50 percenters. Like I have some 50 percent lemon ghost sables and some of the sables look only like normal sables. And other sables actually have some pretty high expression and some nice golds, yellows. Um, they look really pretty. And even you'll see it even in the the normals, all the normal lemon goats. Like you can look at, oh, those are all lemon goats. They're 50 percenters. And they come from like my best lineage. And that's the thing. I usually, most of my lemon goats, I did not outcross until I had these really strong, um, you know, 10 generation, high quality um, lemon goats. Because when you outcrossed them, you, you would start to get, you know, you, you would just diminish a lot of those characteristics. And they have to be bred back in. So unless you're doing an incomplete dominant trait like anaconda, it's going to be a little more difficult because you're going to be working with a bunch of toss hats, like say if you're doing like toffee or sable. But uh, I finally got like some 75% lemon ghost anacondas, and they look really good. All right. And so now I want to um, – I'm going to bring up a few pictures of some of the, the animals that you've produced that where you've incorporated um, some of your line bread um, – genes so the first one i'm gonna bring up is a snake that you posted in 2019 yeah yeah and you had it labeled as a lemon ghost um purple extreme conda so kind of um talk about this animal well i had some purple extreme red condas um that were really pretty bred that into a lemon ghost um held those lemon ghost kind of extreme red outcrosses back and actually bred it back to a high percent lemon ghost that had a small percent, like 25% extreme purple red. But this is the one that showed pretty good um, characteristics of extreme purple red. And this is a pretty cool example because um, it's actually pretty high percentage lemon ghost, um, but lower um, percentage extreme purple red. And so that's the thing. These things are kind of hard to define because obviously an outcross extreme purple red isn't as good as a really good quality um, really lime bread one. But I think with the lemon ghost characteristics, it actually actually kind of uh, goes with it and makes it pop because the lemon ghost is, you know, causing the colors to be brighter. Um, it's also, you know, making it, uh, giving it better contrast and everything. Because if you imagine, look at that, the reddish saddles um, and imagine the background's like a dark brown. It wouldn't pop as much. So, it wouldn't have been really considered that high quality of an extreme purple red, but because the lemon ghost there with the contrast actually makes it look like a, a way better one. So that's the thing. Um, my friend urged me to post it because I guess somebody else had, po uh, had posted some and they said that they had these. And uh, he's like, well, I was like, well, I don't really want to. And he's like, yeah, but this guy's saying he has the project. He's the only one. I'm like, well, if he wants to, that's fine. He goes, can you just please post it? So I was like, okay. And I posted it. Um, <laughs> But you go, because I have a few of them. But the thing is, like, you know, these projects are far from done. Um, again, they're like, I think they're really in their infancy. You can do so much more with them. I think lemon goats can be lime bred to the point where you get um, really consistent neon yellow hog nose. And they're not quite there yet. And that's the cool thing about lime breeding, because, again, you see what they've done with koi carp over hundreds of years. Uh, I think the hog nose um, 
market, as long as people or the, it was a hog nose hobby, I should say, within the hog nose hobby, somebody that wants to carry on and line breed this stuff, I think in a hundred years, you're going to see some really crazy looking hog nose snakes, especially if people keep on selectively line breeding. Um, but again, right now, even though a lot of people that get into the selectively line breeding these traits, I don't, they don't really seem to have a, I don't know, the, the, the same kind of, um, the same kind of like goal, they end up start crossing immediately into all these other traits and it starts to diminish it. Now they can start, they can actually line breed it back. And that is very possible. Um, not only is it possible, it's, it would really, it would work if you do it, it's going to work, but it's just, uh, it's a long detour that you're getting away from the main project to incorporate this new gene. You got to come back and bring it back in. And, you know, it'll be good results, um, especially down the road. But I think with a lot of these projects, you know, there's going to be there's major improvements that can be made in the next 10, 20 years. OK. And so now I'm going to bring up another picture. And this is more of a recent uh, snake that you've posted. And this is your um, your lemon ghost sable. I think you said you mentioned that it's fifty percent lemon ghost. Yeah, yeah, that's fifty percent. But the one thing I'll point out, hmm, I don't like, but the, it, it's uh, better quality than most fifty percenters than really anybody else can really make um, because this is from like my best neon lemon ghost that I did not outcross that stayed pretty much within the project for the last like 15 some plus years and then that crossed because we actually when i took my best those those lemon ghosts and bred them to just a straight normal sable a lot of those because all the babies came out lemon ghosts because it's such at that point it's so powerful it, like you'd have the same results if you took a red like say if you took a raging red and you line bred it for the next 10 years and you say line bred it and i'll cross it one time into like a phoenix red or an extreme red you kept line breeding it you had these ones that are just super bright, deep blood, red saturated. It's just not going to go away with one outcrossing. It's not actually not going to go away at all. If you outcross it to say just like a nice normal hog nose um, that has some like, you know, high contrast, nice brownish saddles, all the babies are going to be red. Now they're not going to look as good as the original uh, ones, but all the parents to these, to all the 11 ghost 50 percenters at Sable I made, looked almost like they looked like low quality 100 percent lemon ghost because they were just so strong but the funny thing is they actually look better than most of their offspring the parents and so i bred the parents together that were both 50 percent lemon ghost high quality lemon ghost uh 100 at sables a lot of the baby lemon ghosts that are 66 percent pass at sable they look good they look good um but they they look like 50 percent lemon ghost to me i'm like oh these are nice but they're not real strong yellows they're kind of like lighter colored they're more of like kind of like a light you know uh buttery yellow which is more greenish they're more greenish and uh but i did get a couple high quality ones that male's a decent example i have way better looking ones i just didn't post them and um so but again i actually hopefully by the end of this year i'll hatch out some 75 percent lemon ghost sables and i was able to do that through making the lemon ghost are um 50 percent lemon ghost Pet sables, bringing those to again one of my best. Actually, she's one of my nicest. She's like just screaming neon yellow, one hundred percent lemon ghost. And those seventy five percenters look really good. And they're pass And I bred some of those together. And it's funny, even with the seventy five percenters, you only have varying degrees. I have one that's like really pretty, extremely high expression lemon ghost. Looks like a hundred percenter. And then her sister next to her is more. Looks like a 50 percenter. It's like greenish yellow and everything. But that's what happens when you do the outcrosses. Even though these are 75 percenters and they're bred back to my best ones, um, you get some varying degree. And that's because lemon ghost isn't quite as strong as things like red. Because um, if you did this with, say, like an extreme purple red, you wouldn't see. Actually, sometimes you can get some pretty brownish ones. But I guess because, like, you know, red and brown and those, like, deep reddish mahogany brownish colors, um, they're... You, you don't see as much as a difference because it's like, okay, these are kind of like a, on a similar color schemes while with lemon ghost, there's like kind of like a lot of melanin removed. And so there's not a lot of these like dark pigments, like kind of like uh, shadowing them. So when I had like this really high quality, 75% lemon ghost, pasta sable next to her sister, they're a bit lighter colored, um, you know, under background. So the one 
sister is kind of like more of like a greenish yellow. And then, then I have a third one too. That's, uh, and she's got this really weird, like mustardy kind of like yellow. <laughs> so, so you get all these like different, uh, um, variations and they can, they're definitely all pretty strong lemon ghosts where it's like, okay, that's definitely a lemon ghost, but you would actually be surprised. Um, if I was to say, Hey, these are all sisters and that's because of the outcross. And that's what I mean by outcrossing. Um, you'll, you, you start to lose some of these qualities pretty, pretty quickly. And that's the, and the reason be, behind that is not all polygenetic line bread traits are equal. Some are stronger than others. And that's why I talk about abandoning some because they're just not strong enough to continue. I see it with the leopard geckos. And there's one particular trait. I'm not going to name it. It's a cool project. People have been working on it for, it's like one of the most chased after projects. <laughs> I don't know if anybody knows what I'm talking about, but they've been going hard at this thing for 15 years. And it's one, in my opinion, that's two different colors that really clash and they kind of combat each other and they kind of cancel each other out. And so they get results that look pretty decent because that juveniles are kind of bright. But then by the time they're adults, the characteristics and those qualities that they're trying to um, extract out just don't really come to fruition and it's a very small percentage that look like the ones they want want and it's it's fighting against the current as hard as you can and it's been going on for 15 years and in my opinion the results are still pretty similar to when they originally started and that, yeah that would have been an example of a project that i would have been like that's cool i'm going to cross it into this to make this pretty and that's it i'm going to work on something else <laughs> All right. And so I'm going to bring up um, one last picture. Um, this is actually a, a snake that you posted yesterday on your Instagram. Okay. And yeah. Is, let's talk about her. Yeah. So the Sable Lemon Ghost Walmart, that's what you have it listed as. Yep. Yeah. Do you want to see her right now? She actually shed. <laughs> okay. Yeah. A, if you can bring her out. I was an idiot and posted that yesterday. And I knew she was in shed, but I was like, yeah, she looks so cool and she's posing. I just want to post a photo, uh, but she shed this morning. So let me go get her. It won't take me long. All right. All right so there she is. Yeah, she's pretty. The coolest thing, one of the cool things about her is probably not showing up, but her belly is really crazy looking. The iridescence on it. And there's like a lot of yellows and greens. Her belly is actually very green. It looks probably more yellow on camera. And so what percent of Lemon Ghost would you say she is? Uh, I would consider her a 50 percenter, but she's actually from like my best like Roma Lemon Ghost lineage, like 100 percenters that were outcross. And she was just the one that's a really high expression, um, you know, with a lower percentage. Uh, one of her brothers is really insane, too. And then there's like one of her sisters is just like pretty nice. And then there's a few others in there that are like, OK. But actually, most of them in this uh, project came out actually pretty amazing. So, okay. yeah, that's nice. Yeah, I had no idea that the, the picture that you posted was her and Shed. So yeah. <laughs> definitely a big difference. Yes. Yeah, there's actually now, if you look at her, she's actually more greenish. Um, she's definitely a little lighter. That's for sure. But you actually have, yeah, there's a lot more um, yellow tones in there and stuff. But, yeah, she's a really high expression. Um, actually, if you were to remove the sable and just she looked that way, she would be considered, like, a high quality, like, Woma, Lemon Ghost, and she would probably be on par with someone 100 percenters. Um, but just because she'd be on par doesn't mean that she actually has that same value, really. Um, they they kind of do, um, like, almost. I mean, obviously, that's, like, a really good one, and it does have the lineage. But a pure one is going to be a lot stronger, especially for outcrosses. Um, and then, you know, or even breeding back into ones like this. Because that's what's really cool about this project is, like, it's an outcross, but you're outcrossing with a really good goal, you know. And the goal is to get that, you know, polygenetic trait with a recessive trait. Okay. And um, you can answer this question if you want. Um, have you incorporated the lemon ghost in any other recessive genes? And yes. has success like the sable? Yeah, uh, definitely. Um, you'll see pretty soon. Maybe in a couple of years I'll post them. But okay. I, I have some other projects. Um, yeah, the one the one I'll, I'll definitely release in a couple of years. I'm not going to talk about which one it is, but uh, you'll see. 
And so does the, the lemon ghost really change how it looks? Is it like a drastic change? The word you can tell one, the lemon ghost is This one in particular is. Um, and that's the thing, too. Lemon ghost, um, it's just definitely it's going to change certain things. Like one trait I probably I wouldn't want to ever incorporate it in would be like, like pastel pink or hypo. Um, lavender might be kind of interesting. I don't think lavender is like a really good one. Um, I think lavender is pretty good because you can – I would also do Woma. Like say if I was to do like hypo. I want to do hypo without Woma because I don't think you're good. But obviously the yellows are good, not going to really be expressed because if you ever look at hypos, you never really see yellow pigmentation or anything close to that uh, being expressed. It kind of really limits uh, yellow pigmentation. So the one thing is if you were to put it into a trait um, where you're not so sure how the yellow is going to be expressed well, I would definitely just – go after that combination with Woma behind it because if the yellow and the, like the coloration doesn't really interfere with it too much or cause a really cool effect or it doesn't really react the way you want at least the Woma you know that pattern is going to react in a really cool way and that's what I'm doing actually I did a few lavenders um and I think that yellow greenish was is going to make a more bluish color you'll actually get more probably lavender bluish but if it doesn't really work out in that way as much as you'd want it to at least you could get some like really cool patterns because you know that would look really awesome on uh you know like a lavender. Yeah, definitely. All right. So to conclude this uh interview, um, I know earlier you said that you feel that lime breeding and hognose snakes is is an underutilized tool for somebody that wants to get into lime breeding. Um, what advice would you give them if they wanted to start a lime? Um, well, if you want to start your own particular line, it's, that's a tough one because, um, you know, I, I really think you have to look for something that kind of jumps out at you as like, this is a little different and unusual and, um, not quite like anything else you've seen. And then, you know, get that particular animal or hopefully a couple from that same lineage and start there and then start thinking like, what kind of crosses would like, you know, complement it. If say like a grayish, lighter colored hog nose would complement it. Say if you're having ones with like more oval reduced pattern or more like shattered pattern. See if there's any other uh, projects like that that you can outcross into. And so that's a thing. It's just kind of like uh, looking for particular characteristics that, um, you know, that you think would be cool if they were expressed, you know, more expressed a lot more. And uh, that's about it, you know, and then get those and start breeding them and then see if you you know, get the results you want. Um, and if you don't get the results right away, don't abandon it right away. And uh, you can also line breed it while incorporating it into like other stuff, but then you're kind of outcrossing, but you can always breed it back. Um, but that's the one thing. When I when I do my line breeding, I don't do a whole lot of outcrosses. That's like, I'm actually, I'm way behind on Lemon Ghost uh, combinations uh, because I felt like for a long time, they weren't quite ready to be combined into uh, traits. Because I noticed like the qualities would diminish when you outcrossed. And so, but again, I mean, with these low percentages, you will get some that have high expression. Uh, but the more you use, like, say, from a lineage that's been really, really pushed, where it's like, you know, has a really high quality, high expression, high percentages, those, of course, work way better for outcrossing, which I, I kind of already talked about that. But yeah, going back, just, uh, uh, for somebody with a new lineage or a new line that they want to start, you know, just look for something kind of like, you know, like shadow hog nose was one. And, um, I feel like that one kind of got outcrossed and I feel like that was something I remember early on, there was actually some that actually had some interesting characteristics and qualities. And I'm not sure what happened with it. I'm not sure if it just wasn't something that was that strong, that could be line bred. And it just didn't really, um, it just really didn't work. And it's what, something that was just kind of going against the uh, current or if it was something that was just like outcrossed or because they're and that's the thing, too, because I know that is a selectively line bred. But some people are trying to say it's dominant. There's a lot of people that go early on to push polygenetic traits as dominant. And that happens a lot in leopard geckos, too, which I don't understand why um, line breeding is actually pretty exciting because you can continually change the animal and improve on it. Again, like lemon ghosts are far from being done. I think in 100 years, lemon ghosts will look significantly better um versus like some of the best ones i have now but you also got to be careful too because i've seen people where they just keep selectively line breeding and it actually kind of goes against them and they start to actually lose um particular qualities like i noticed like uh 
my dad actually was doing coral ghosts and he kept uh, lime breeding darkest, pinkest ones and most extreme pink. And he actually got to a point where he actually started turning more like orange. And so then he was lime breeding it so strong, xanthophores started popping up and interfering with the red pigment cells, the erythrophores. And so he started getting this more orangey looking snake. And it was really weird looking, but the cool ones were really pink. So if you would have just kept lime breeding these more, the more color saturated ones, they started running into orange and it was a different kind of orange. And that would have been a, actually a good spin-off project than to spin that off and go, okay, well, this is a different project, but it derives from um, Coral Ghost. And uh, trying to think, uh, another good, oh, Red Stripe Leopard Geckos, HQ Reptiles. I mentioned this in the Palmetto State Geckos. He had the best Red Stripes. And they looked the best from 2003 to 2007. Like, nobody could touch the guy's Red Stripes. And he, kept lying, and he actually went to, like, F10 and F11. And so he just kept taking his best red stripes and breeding them together. And um, it was almost like, um, I don't want to say, it was, it was very interesting, but it was kind of almost like, you know, there was like basically simulated like, hey, we're just going to keep breeding the best ones from each generation together. And that's going to ultimately mean this is going to be improved. And in this case, it didn't. They ended up getting, they ended up getting more carrot tail. And so he kept line breeding ones with more carrot tail, more orange bodies, while they were also more hypoed. But it's kind of like the lemon ghost. When I noticed the ones that got more hypoed, you would also lose a lot of pigment saturation. And you get these more faded out ones. And um, so that's, again, like the lemon ghost with the more black, they had more pigment saturation. Well, with the red stripes, he kept lime breeding them. They kept getting more hypoed. So now there was less pigment saturation. So now those dark, burnt, orangish red stripes started turning more brown and lighter brown. And then the carrot tail kept increasing. And by the time the guy got to F10, F11... These things were like a pale orange with like a faint brown stripe and like a 100% carrot tail with a white stripe down it. And they looked cool, but they did not look like anything like the original red stripes. And uh, in my opinion, they didn't look as good. Uh, and so that was kind of like, you know, at that point, he kept, he just line bred them into a completely different direction. And it kind of went against the original characteristics. But I guess in his, uh, you know, Breedings, he was like, well, this is a continually improved version, and it's the improved next generation, therefore it is improved. Uh, but it actually completely changed it. Okay, that's interesting. It I is. Say, um, like I say, your experience with the leopard geckos and fat tail geckos, I, I knew that was going to be a good question because they – like you say, you can breed those pretty quick. And so you can use the experience from that yes. and kind of apply them to different animals. And then the other thing is too, leopard geckos, like the whole entire hobby and the fun part of it is selectively line breeding. And so that's what always like, some people are like, oh no, there's a new this leopard gecko trait. Oh, it's gotta be dominant. I'm like, that doesn't, I was like, I was like you can tell it's not dominant because you're getting all these varying degrees. And I was like, and pretty much everything in leopard geckos, you know, aside from these straight hereditary traits, these few traits, um, you know, everything is lime bread and the lime bread stuff you can do the most with, like look at black knights. That's like the coolest leopard gecko trait on the market in the hobby. It's really stirred things up. And there's actually a lot that can be done with it. Um, aside from just, um, making pure melanistic, just even the hyper melanistic stuff, uh, a lot of hyper melanistic and melanistic projects are very fun. I mean, look at like sables and stuff. Sables like the best color enhancer because it has pigment saturation, increases melanin, and it's also increasing the saturation of the other pigments. So once that melanin is removed in other projects like Sunburst and like Mai Tai, you see what it's doing underneath it. You know, you see what's going on under the hood when combined with these other traits. And then you can also, you know, add traits to even make them even blacker and darker, like Exanthic and like say even did like a Super Conda Storm Cloud. That is going to look really insane. So, um, you know, and that, those are not line bred, but the thing is, certain line bred traits can have, um, like, you know, s similarities, like, you know, like Black Knight, you know, that's full melanistic. And even when you outcross it, you can get some ones that are, like, in between. And, uh, you know, and that's the thing, too, with these recessive traits and these incomplete dominant traits and hog nose, and having line bred traits make them that much more fun. So when you have your extreme red albinos, I mean, look at sunburst. If you're just going to do sunburst, like, hey, I want to make nice sunburst. Well, what's a good way to make nice sunburst other than putting extreme red into them? Like, you know, you could put Arctic and, you know, that's going to be awesome. But adding extreme red is going to make it uh, really pretty. So, yeah, line breeding is really important uh, for, you know, just like uh, I think just having fun in the hobby as far as like, you know, making morph combinations. Because if it was just only straight hereditary traits, you know, 
there wouldn't be so much variation, but line breeding adds a lot of variation and a whole lot more aspects to like, you know, what you can do with projects. You can make one project look so many different ways. Um, actually look at black knights. If you have like tangerines in them or eclipse, um, uh, with like, you know, well, I was going to say snow, <laughs> max snow, that's incomplete dominant. So that's not a good example of line bread, but it's still early. Like I've been doing hyperxanthic and bolts and giants into the black knights. Other people have been doing, uh, blood like tangerines. I'm doing some blood purple heads and, um, then there's, um, black knights that have like really stretched full body pattern that, um, that's like the only, the only pattern, um, traits that you see on leopard geckos like that are only in black knights. So black knights can actually be spun off so many ways and it's line bread. Then there's other traits that pop up and pick, no, it can't be line bread. I'm like, well, sure. It acts like a line bread. It looks like a line bread. It's like, it's not derogatory. I'm like, that's actually great. You know, that means you can improve on it and you can do things with it for the next 20, 30, 40 years. Um, you know, if you have like a hypomelanistic hog nose, it's like, that's great too. But if there's no other traits to combine it into, or there's nothing you can line breed it with, it's just that. And that's still great. But um, part of the fun of the hobby is, you know, creating new stuff and making things different and uh, sharing that with others. Yeah, and it, it definitely seems that uh, line breeding just makes things better. And it makes does. It more unique. All right. And so to conclude this, if uh, for people that who don't that for people that do not know you, um, where can they uh, purchase an animal from you and uh, where can they find you on social media? Yeah, so I've been I've been uh, that <laughs> I've been a bit difficult in that area, right? As of recently, uh, I had some health problems, but now that's kind of like you know going away. And um, but Morph Market, uh, Morph Market's pretty good. But then I'm also like you know you go on Morph Market, you actually might find something cooler from somebody else, and there's a lot of cool hog nose on there. But uh, yeah, you can always contact me through my Instagram. Uh, but then I'm probably just going to direct you to my Morph Market. Uh, some people I've been like, uh, recently contacted me directly and I'll show them a few example pictures, but there are people that are more looking for pets and I'm like, well, I don't really quite have that. They're like, do you have any regular albinos? I'm like, yeah, like, they're all heck coral. So they're going to be more. And they're like, I don't know what that means. And I'm like, yeah, I was like, it might be better if you buy one from another breeder. Like I know I was like an ectotherm empire. They had some really nice ones posted recently. Jamie from J and C, um, you know, and a few other people posted some really nice hog nose, but, um, you know, I, I still have a few that are on the, the lower end side for somebody that's like more entry level. And then actually, I, I have some cool ones I just recently posted. Like I posted an Anaconda double head sunburst. I posted some super Arctic stuff. I, I actually I got to produce uh, post an Exanthaconda head snow mail that's very pretty, and uh, some more sable stuff. And I'll probably post some coral combos too, maybe, or I should say, um, het corals. All right. So I'll definitely leave uh, the links to your Morph Market page as well as your Instagram page in the description. And I um, appreciate everybody for watching another interview. Um, I've learned a lot and I'm pretty sure y'all have learned a lot. So we'll see y'all for the next video.